The world belongs to God, the earth and all its people. How good it is, how wonderful, to live together in unity. Love and faith come together, justice and peace join hands. If Christ's disciples keep silent, these stones would shout aloud. Open our lips, O God, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Let us worship God this day. Welcome to this time of worship with the St. Andrew's Church community. As many of you know, in addition to these online services, we have been meeting for gathered worship services over the past few weeks, and everything seems to have gone fairly smoothly and well in those gathered services, so, so far so good. We are planning to continue to offer these online services as well as our gathered in-person services for the foreseeable future, and we are continuing to monitor the various public health guidelines and regulations that need to be in place as the fall season unfolds. We're very pleased this week to welcome more of the members of the St. Andrew's Choir back to our services, both in the online sense and in the gathered community. Over the summer months, in the online service and in the gathered services of the last two weeks, we have been very much enjoying a soloist each week. Today, however, all eight members of the choir will be participating, four in the online service and the other four in the in-person service. A huge thanks is extended to each of them and also to Dan Bickle, whose ongoing leadership in the musical life of our congregation is such a marvelous part of our life together. As you have already noticed, we are pleased that Bob Ferris is back in today's service after a few weeks of summer rest and relaxation. It is very good to have him back among us. There are many opportunities to be involved in the life and ministry of the congregation at St. Andrews, and if you would like more information about all the various services and activities that are taking place at the church, you're very welcome to visit the church website at www.standrewstoronto.org. Now let us draw our hearts and minds together as we prepare to worship the living God this day. Let us pray. Living God, artist of the changing skies, builder of the steadfast earth, risen Christ, born to walk life's journey with us, spirit of life, always moving in us and among us, 
Your presence surrounds us here and everywhere we go. Your purpose holds the world in its place. Your imagination engages us each step of the way. Friends, let us bring our confession to the God of life, seeking forgiveness and healing. God of time and of eternity, we confess that we have long memories, especially for things that hurt us, for moments we resent or regret. Week by week we seek your forgiveness for our mistakes, but we confess we do not forgive others so faithfully. Sometimes we seek opportunity to even the score. Confront us with your mercy, O God, and open our hearts to its cleansing power. And let us continue in our confession in the silence of our hearts. From now on, St. Paul declared, we regard no one from a human point of view. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and everything has become new. Through Christ, God has reconciled us and given us a ministry of reconciliation. Thanks be to God that we can make all things new, this day and every day. God of life, in our time of worship, show us how we can serve you and open our imaginations to the future you create, for we seek your guidance and your grace now and always. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. Verses 20 to 33. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure, and will live at ease, without dread of disaster. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, 
and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens God has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong runner pursues its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from proud thoughts. Do not let them have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking to, at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to come at, to, to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Choices, choices, choices. Whether we take the time to think about it very much or not, the fact is that the ability to make choices is one of the greatest freedoms of the human life. But it's also one of our greatest responsibilities. And this responsibility to make good and wise choices, to consider different options, to weigh the benefits and the risks, to ponder the ethics and morality of different possibilities, and then to make intentional decisions about some issue, these things confront us in a striking way as we consider many of the most complex and current issues of our times. Clearly and obviously, one of the most apparent choices that we are all being asked to make in the coming week or so concerns the federal election campaign. Advanced polls are open, and already both we and our fellow citizens are beginning to make choices 
about which politicians and which party and which policies seem to present the clearest, most compelling ideas that will hopefully have beneficial consequences for our country, for our communities, for our lives, and for the challenge of meeting the issues and events that confront us these days. But it's interesting for us to realize that questions related to freedom and responsibility in our choices are not limited to decisions that we are asked to make every few years at the ballot box. Over the past few weeks, our friends to the south have faced complicated and controversial situations rooted in questions about whether the government should have the right to place limits on the choices that a person can make about their own body in relation to pregnancy. Many question whether a government should ever have the right or the responsibility to tell a person what choices they can and cannot make when it comes to their own body. And yet at the same time, much of the debate about vaccination also turns on this question of choice. Should the choice about vaccination be left to the individual or should they be mandatory and legislated choices? And if mandatory, how could such policies, how should such policies be enforced? Should the wider community have any power to tell a person what choices they are allowed to make about what is put into their bodies? And if not, what freedoms should be limited if a person makes the free choice not to be vaccinated? And while it's perhaps not quite as controversial as questions related to elections and vaccinations, we've all had to wrestle over the last year and a half at least with a whole range of choices involving our freedom and our responsibility. What choices should we make about whether our kids learn in class or online? What choices should we make about seeing friends and relatives? What choices should we make about sitting in a restaurant or going back to the office or doing once safe activities such as going to the gym or attending a live music event or watching a movie in a theater? Should we go to church these days in person or should we choose to watch a service online? Choices, choices, choices. Having choices is usually seen as a good thing in life, but it can be important for us to realize that can also it can create stress and even anxiety within us. The presence of options in complex situations has been shown to actually increase the stress that many people feel. And often, regardless of the decision that is made, the very fact that a person has come to narrow things from a range of options down to a particular chosen course of action actually reduces the stress that they feel. Some would argue at times that there are, there are situations in which we as humans would actually prefer that others assume the responsibility to make choices for us if for no other reason, then we do not enjoy the stress that the freedom and the responsibility to make our own choices creates within us. This is not, however, a new dilemma. From time immemorial, the spiritual and religious traditions of our world and the poets and storytellers across all cultures have actually presented us with situations in which questions related to human choice stand at the heart of some of the greatest and most enduring narratives of the human race. The opening story in the Bible, for example, and particularly the second creation account, which focuses on the experience of the imagined characters of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This actually turns on the question of choice, the decision that the characters are invited to make about whether or not to follow the guidelines that have been given to them from God about which fruit in the garden they should eat. Choices, choices, choices. It's interesting to note that today's suggested readings invite us to ponder questions related to the choices that we are invited to make as human beings, but also as people of faith. A reading from Proverbs, for example, as with so much of the wisdom literature of the Bible, sets before us the decision to choose between two different ways of life. On the one hand, the path and pursuit of wisdom, and on the other hand, the descent into foolishness. 
We're invited in today's passage to hear and to heed the call of Lady Wisdom, personified wisdom, as a woman calling out to those in the street to follow her on a path that would lead to life and to blessing and to divine and human favor. Wisdom cries out in the street, we read. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. This was the call of Lady Wisdom. But on the other hand, the wisdom literature also presents the image of foolishness as a beguiling yet ultimately destructive woman whose ways might seem enticing and seductive at first, but whose influence in a person's life, this pursuit of foolishness, would lead to brokenness and misery and destruction. So the choice is set before us. Will we as human beings seek the ways of wisdom or the way of foolishness? The choice is ours to make, and the book of Proverbs, from which we read today, as well as the entire section of the book called the Wis of the Bible, called the Wisdom Literature, seeks to show us the pathway of wisdom so that we can be given the tool to make good and wise choices about how to live out our lives on a day-to-day -day and very practical basis, how to avoid evil, how to deal honestly with people, how to deal with hard-to-deal-with people, how to do good, how to live wisely, how to be faithful. Our Gospel lesson today similarly invites us to ponder the choice that Jesus himself set before his first followers, a choice that is set before each one of us even now. The passage begins with a question that Jesus put to his followers, who do people say that I am? It was a relatively objective question, a request to simply report back to him what the disciples had been hearing others saying, and respond they did. Some say Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead, some say you're one of the prophets. But it was Jesus' second question that changed the conversation entirely, and that actually was rooted in the choice that he was asking his followers to make. But who do you say that I am? he asked. No longer could the disciples simply report what they had heard or observed other people saying. Now they had to answer the question for themselves. Who do you say that I am? What choice are you going to make about who you believe that Jesus was? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Peter's response was a statement of belief rather than a mere reporting of what others were saying about Jesus. Peter had made a decision about who he had come to believe that Jesus was. Peter had made his choice. And in this, there's much that we can relate to. After all, there's still a lot that is said about Jesus in our wider culture, even as it was in the time of the disciples. It is quite possible to ask the same question that was put to those disciples. We could go out the doors of the church and just simply find out, who do people say that Jesus is? And even simply as a historical figure, Jesus continues to play a central role in our culture and in our world, not least in the simple fact that we measure the passage of years and centuries in relation to the approximate date of his birth, about 2,021 years ago. So the question, who do people say that I am, is still a question that Christ could pose to us, even if he were standing among us and that we could be invited to answer even today. But it's his second question that actually is one that he could also put to us. But who do you say that I am? And the consequences for how we answer that question are worthy of our reflections. Because there are consequences for claiming Jesus as Messiah, as Christ, as Lord, as Peter did. And Jesus responded to, Jesus, to Peter's declaration, not simply with a commendation that he got the answer right, yes, I'm the Messiah. Rather, Jesus responded to Peter with an articulation of some of the implications, some of the consequences of what it meant to claim him as Messiah. Suddenly, 
the tone of Jesus' conversation seemed to change. He began speaking about a Messiah who was going to suffer, who was going to have to bear a cross, who was going to be killed, and who would give up life rather than cling to it. To choose to call Jesus the Messiah was fine, as Peter did, but it was necessary in the eyes of Christ to realize what the consequences of such a choice were going to be, what the cost of discipleship would include, the willingness to bear the burden of suffering for the sake of love, a willingness to let go of living for oneself, but instead being willing to give of oneself selflessly for the sake of others. A willingness to follow Jesus even when the going got tough and his way seemed to be the way of a crushed and crucified loser rather than the way of a victorious and triumphant Messiah. Choosing to follow Jesus was not going to be a free pass from the challenges of life, but instead it was going to be a call. It was going to be an invitation. It was going to be a choice to go with him into the world's brokenness, its sorrow, its hunger, its pain. And they were being asked to willingly and intentionally choose to do so. And that is precisely what Jesus' followers have been trying to do ever since seeking to be present and to serve in places of pain and suffering, seeking to take on the challenges of feeding the poor and the hungry, seeking to bring comfort to the sick and the sorrowing, seeking to embrace the marginalized and the excluded, seeking to stand against oppression and injustice, seeking to return good for evil, seeking to live by forgiveness, seeking to live by grace, seeking to overcome hatred with the power of love. Or at least, that's what we've been trying to do. Have we as the followers of Jesus been perfect in that attempt to pick up our cross daily and follow him? Absolutely not. Not even Peter who walked with Jesus himself always got it right. Even Peter made poor, unwise, unfaithful choices. But Peter's mistakes, his bad choices, were not the end of the story. Any more than our failures to make the right decisions, the right choices, have been the end of the story for us either. Which means that whatever good we have done in the past and whatever mistakes we have made in the past, the choice is one that continues to confront us, continues to come to us even now. Will we live for ourselves? Or will we follow the one who we claim as our Messiah? Will we seek to save our own lives and make choices primarily rooted in our desire to preserve what we believe is best for ourselves? Or will we make the choice to follow the one who gave his life for us and invites us to choose to do the same in response to him? This ability to make choices is at the heart of the Christian life. What choices will we make if we claim that Jesus is the Messiah? And we should embrace this ability because the ability to make choices, even in the spiritual life, is indeed a great freedom and a great responsibility. So we, may we make good choices, wise choices in every part of our lives so that our lives can be lived wisely, faithfully, compassionately, and well because this is precisely what our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, calls us and commends us to do. And why does he call us? Why does he invite us to do this? He does so because then his light and his love and his power and his glory can bless this world that he loves. His kingdom can come to this world and his will can be done on this earth, even as it is in heaven. And for that, all we can say is thanks be to God, and amen. Let us affirm our faith today in words from a new creed from the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, 
who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. God of inspiration and imagination, you are the artist of our lives. You have filled your world with gifts, expressed through the creativity and dedication of so many. We give you thanks for a new season of opportunity to gather together again and share gifts that have lain in wait for months of isolation and uncertainty. Today we give you thanks for the artists among us, emerging from time in solitude and reflection. Thank you for painters and poets, for lines on a canvas and lines on a page, which inspire us and leave us wondering. Thank you for sculptors and storytellers who fashion faces in stone and scenes in words to outline the profile of your truth for us. God of grace and goodness, we know your creativity in the arts of fabric and foodstuff and in hands that work with wood and keep machinery humming. We give you thanks for those who stitch patterns with thread and those who set patterns on our plates, mixing colors and flavors. Thank you for those who build and repair, finish and restore the things we need and the things we cherish. God of music and movement, we know your beauty in the gifts of keyboard and composer, in the blending of voices and the blend bending of dancers. We thank you for these sounds and sights that can touch our hearts once more and open our souls to praise you. God of hope and healing, we thank you too for the healing arts, for the care and relief offered by professionals throughout our healthcare system, and for support given to those who suffer by friends and volunteers. We pray for all who seek healing, those anticipating or recovering from surgery, those living with pain or illness, those struggling with grief and loss, those who bear anxiety, depression or dementia, and other conditions which trouble mind and body. Give each one your presence and peace through our prayer and friendship. Reach out through us to bring aid and advocacy to the most vulnerable of your creatures. We pray our prayers in the name of the one who is the Lord of the dance and the weaver of our lives. Amen.
And now may the love of Almighty God, the grace of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the comfort and friendship of God's Holy Spirit dwell with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.